recording in progress. And then Jacob, you do that. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. It was yeah, very I echoey. Oh, there. So, yeah, but when so, you get the video, you'll trim the, the intro, right? I can't hear a word you're saying. It's very echoey. Oh, sure. All right. I just muted everybody. So when you get the video, uh, you'll trim the 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 first bit. Okay, perfect. So and then our panelists, you can you can unmute yourself, I guess, at this point. So. No. Felt like I was being put in time out there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Such Zoom power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's just give it a minute or two more and we've got people starting to file in. See some familiar names logged in, so glad to have you back. So, well, it is two o'clock, so I know we're uh, a little bit tight on our time today. We have a very uh, focused panel discussion, so we will just jump in. It's recording, so we're in good shape. So thank you to everybody who has joined and continues to join, so see me keep allowing people in as the... Uh, as the session goes, I should have waited one more second because there were a few extras, but today we have a special Zoom panel designed specifically for Sabre Chicago chapter. So I am thankful for our panelists and I'll leave the uh, introductions to uh, Dr. Sharon Hamilton in just a minute, but um, looking ahead very quickly, our chapter's September event will be a, Be a Beloit Snappers game on September 11th. We already have about 17 people interested in tickets. So Tim from our chapter, if you've received our last newsletter, if you've been getting some of the email correspondence, if you haven't RSVP'd for that, please reach out to him. He's trying to lock down this week a, a final head count because we are doing that jointly with our friends to the north, uh, the Ken Keltner chapter in uh, Wisconsin. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Sharon Hamilton. If you're not familiar with her, she's uh, been very busy in the world of Zoom. She uh, certainly jumped in a relatively recent member of Sabre and um, is serving as the chair of the new Century Committee. So we are looking back 100 years. And today's topic, the title of the session is Eight Men Out. It's the centennial panel in the aftermath of the Black Sox criminal trial. And if you've been around Sabre over the last couple of years, we've hit a lot of milestones connected with the uh, infamous 1919 Chicago White Sox team. You might, might have attended the, uh, you know, back in the pre-pandemic days, the uh, Black Sox uh, scam symposium that was held at the Chicago History Museum. And uh, Jacob is one of our speakers who was uh, instrumental in that happening. And then obviously, um, there's a lot of focus on the games themselves and, and the series being thrown. But today, we're going to focus a little bit more on the aftermath and the legacy that has come from the trial. And we were just joking a little bit beforehand that, you know, there, you know, the pandemic's been an unfortunate thing, but uh, it, it lined up an event. If you if you've got a chance to watch the field of dream games, the uh, White Sox uh, managed to pull off an exciting victory over the New York Yankees in the uh, game that the White Sox skipper Tony La Russa has lovingly dubbed the corn game, uh, at least locally, that's how it's uh, been referred to. So, for the next hour and a half, I'm going to hand it over to our esteemed panelists, and I'll uh, let uh, Sharon take it from here. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for that kind introduction. 
And welcome to all of you who are here to listen to this panel today. Just a reminder that this panel is being recorded and it will be on the Sabre website. So if you don't want to appear, then uh, keep your cameras off and you can always throw your questions into the chat. And it's very helpful. We'll be monitoring the chat, but it's helpful if you actually write the word question or put a question mark before your question so we can distinguish the questions from the chatter. So I'm very excited to be here today. This is, uh, for those of you who've been following Sabre 50 at 50 this summer, this is a sequel event. So the exciting prequel was last weekend, and hopefully you caught that. Uh, Jacob Pomrenke, as chair of the Sabre Black Sox Scandal Research Committee, put together a fantastic panel last weekend on the 100th anniversary of the Black Sox criminal trial. And if you haven't caught that yet, the video is available now so you can watch that at your leisure it was a really good panel so today is sort of the follow-on to the panel that we had last time and this is the aftermath of the trial so we're not going to be talking about the trial itself because jacob's panel last week was looking at that we're going to be talking about what happened right afterwards so we're at the beginning of august the jury has decided after very limited deliberation that the players should be acquitted, that already is a bit of a mystery and it's something that the panelists were talking about last week. How did that happen? I mean, you even had player confessions about accepting money from gamblers that the uh, jury came to that kind of surprising conclusion of acquittal for the players. But they were acquitted and right afterwards there were massive celebrations and this leads to my first question for our panelists today, which is going to be for Jacob, and it has to do with the immediate aftermath of the trial. So the players have been acquitted and then there's this very famous scene, which is in the movie Eight Men Out, where the players and the jurors are eating together after the trial. So my question for Jacob, oh, first of all, before I read the question, I should tell you who he is. I'm gonna introduce Jacob and then I'll read his question. So Jacob Pomrenke is Sabre's Director of Editorial Content and the Chair of the Black Sox Scandal Research Committee. He is the editor of Scandal on the South Side, the 1919 Chicago White Sox and the Eight Myths Out Project for Sabre. So Jacob, my question for you. There's a scene that seems to be straight out of fiction in the movie Eight Men Out about the just acquitted Black Sox players and their jurors eating together just after the trial in a Chicago restaurant. Did that event really happen? And if yes, how did you manage to solve the mystery of where that event took place? Well, th thank you, Sharon, for that introduction and uh, for having me on the panel today. I'm always happy to come here and talk baseball and talk Black Sox uh, with everybody. So as far as the... Uh, the, the jurors were concerned. Uh, this was, you know, just kind of a, a fantastic scene um, in the courtroom itself uh, with the players and their attorneys and the jurors all celebrating uh, in the courtroom. And then they uh, posed for a photo on the courthouse uh, steps uh, afterwards. This was published in the Chicago Tribune uh, for everyone to see. And so the, uh, the idea that there was any separation between the defendants and the jurors who were actually uh, charged with, you know, rendering a verdict in their case. Um, you know, there was no separation whatsoever. And uh, th there were stories that came out the next day that the players and the jurors were celebrating together. Um, and you, you, you know, th this was not a secret uh, for anybody. And uh, we later learned, uh, thanks to uh, Eddie Seacott's attorney, um, his daughter uh, from Detroit uh, later gave an interview in the 1970s and uh, told us about this party um, that was thrown by an associate of Al Capone's um, who was involved uh, heavily in politics in Chicago in the 1920s. Um, Diamond Joe Esposito was the guy's name and he ran a cafe called the Bella Napoli uh, on the west side of uh, Chicago down near Hull House and uh, what is now the University of Illinois at Chicago campus. And that's where the Black Sox players and uh, the jurors ended up all in the same restaurant having this party um, into the wee hours. Uh, for some accounts say that the party lasted till three or four in the morning. Um, you know, and this is uh, how they ended up celebrating uh, at the end of the night. So Jacob, I'm curious about something. When you found that reference, which must have been a great eureka moment for you in the interview uh, about the actual naming of the restaurant, were you looking for it? Or was that just you happened to be reading an interview with her and you went, oh my goodness, that's the name of the restaurant. Well, you know, like a lot of research, you end up going on tangents. You find, you know, one little breadcrumb that leads you on a trail. And I had been searching uh, for information about Eddie Seacott. 
and the lawyer uh, by the name of Daniel Cassidy um, that he had uh, hired himself um, to represent him at the trial. Um, and Cassidy uh, didn't really have much to do during the trial. They had much more uh, high-powered lawyers uh, defending them uh, in Chicago uh, than, than to have this, you know, old friend of Eddie Seacott uh, from Detroit. But uh, but yeah, he was uh, Cassidy was a, a very interesting lawyer. He ended up living to almost the age of 100. Um, and, you know, so there were a lot of interviews uh, of him later in life and interviews with his family um, because he had a, a very prestigious career up in Detroit. And so I ended up following uh, a breadcrumb and ending up with this interview in the Detroit uh, Free Press. And I think it was 1975. And uh, his daughter ended up talking about, um, you know, this party, which clearly had been, you know, a story that had lived on in family lore. Um, and again, there had been some bits and pieces in the Chicago newspapers about this party after the immediately after the trial ended. Um, but nobody had really given any details about it. But uh, Cassidy's daughter ended up just, you know, blurting it out uh, to the newspaper, you know, saying exactly where it was. And so from there, it was just digging up uh, what this restaurant was, uh, who this guy Diamond Joe Esposito was, you know, again, he was a political operative um, in Chicago, and he had ties to Al Capone. Um, and so, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of where the story ended up. I love that. It sounds like something out of a movie. The fact that you even found a tie to Al Capone doesn't seem real, but there it is. You, you, you found all these things and you found the primary sources that supported that the story really took place. It's a great story. And for those of you who want to read more of it, uh, Jacob has written a fantastic article on that and it's actually included. It's one of the linked articles in the Sabre Century Project, the 1921 web project that's just gone up in the aftermath section on the Black Sox trial. So thank you for that, Jacob. Great answer. So my next question is going to be for Dan Levitt. So I'll read you his bio note first and then I'll ask my question for Dan. So Dan Levitt is the author of several award-winning baseball books and numerous essays. He is the treasurer of Sabre and co-chair of Sabre's Business of Baseball Committee. Dan is a recipient of the Bob Davids Award and Chadwick Award. He is currently working on a book with Mark Armour on the intersection of cheating and innovation in baseball. So here's my question for Dan. Dan, in 1921, organized baseball had its first ever season with the commissioner of baseball. How did organized baseball end up with an outsider overseeing its business? And as part of your answer, could you tell us something about the so-called Lasker plan? Sure. Uh, thanks, Sharon. It's great to be here talking baseball on a Saturday afternoon. The short story is that baseball's owners went for an outsider to run their business because the existing governance had become so chaotic and dysfunctional. As you know, until the coming of Judge Landis, baseball was run by the National Com Commission, uh, a three-man panel made up of the president of the NL, the president of the AL, and Chairman Gary Herman, the president of the Reds. You know, though it had disintegrated by 1920, in fairness, the commission structure actually wasn't a bad compromise back in 1903. Back then, the two leagues were still mortal enemies. Herman was the perfect third member, a member of the NL, yet a longtime friend of AL President Van Johnson from their time in Cincinnati. For the dozen or so years after the settlement, the two leagues carried on a more or less friendly rivalry, and the commission functioned well. Then things started to deteriorate. First, there were several player disposition cases. In 1915, the commission ruled against Pittsburgh owner Barney Dreyfus in the George Sisler case. Dreyfus vowed to oust Herman when the opportunity arose. A few years later, the commission awarded pitcher Scott Perry to the Braves over the A's. Both Philly and AL president Van Johnson were infuriated at this. The athletics broke precedent and went to court, a move that was actually encouraged by Johnson. NL president John Tanner was so dismayed that he recommended canceling the World Series if Philadelphia did not relent. When the NL owners were not willing to go that far, Tanner resigned. Herman's dithering and contradictory messages during the case cost him respect on all sides, and the NL owners became further embittered towards Johnson. Johnson also deepened an enmity with White Sox owner Charles Comiskey when the commission ruled that pitcher Jack Quinn belonged to the Yankees instead of the White Sox. And there were other issues beyond player control controversies. Johnson's first real loss of prestige came during World War I, on July 20th, 1918, as many of you know, Secretary of War Newton Baker ruled baseball players were subject to the worker fight order. At this point, Johnson ordered the American League season canceled, a move that would have cost the owners a huge amount of money. 
The owners simply ignored Johnson and played on. They later overruled him again and extended the season through Labor Day with the World Series to follow. The 1918 World Series itself led to further embarrassment for the commission. The players were angry about the reduced World Series share they, would they were gonna receive that year under a new distribution plan. The commission agreed to a hastily conceived meeting with the players and a lot of onlookers before game five. At the meeting, Johnson and Herman embarrassed themselves and the commission by being drunk. After spending the morning imbibing and hobnobbing, they spent that morning at the hotel. Uh, baseball's owners might not have yet been ready to make a full scale overhaul of their governance, but the NL magnets in particular were getting antsy to unseat Herman. Prior to the 1919 season, the owners tasked Johnson and new NL president, John Hadler, to come up with some neutral candidates for the commission chair. More chaos ensued that summer in the AL when Carl Mays jumped to the Red Sox and Johnson ordered him suspended. Instead, the Red Sox sold him to the Yankees. Johnson then suspended Mays and the Yankee owners went to court for an injunction allowing Mays to play. The American League was now in open civil war. The anti-Johnson faction consisted of the Yankees, Red Sox, and White Sox, who were labeled the Insurrectos. The other five franchise owners remained loyal to Johnson. Hence, they were nicknamed the Loyal Five. While the AL was battling itself, the NL owners forced Herman's resignation in January. Once again, Johnson and Tanner headed up a search committee to find a replacement. In the meantime, baseball was left operating in 1920 without meaningful governance. Johnson dithered in the search because he did not want a new commission chair that might downgrade his powers. Before the owners could enforce some sort of resolution on Johnson and Hadler, however, events intervened. And I'd just like to make it aside that had a new commission chairman been named during the season, it is highly likely that the commission structure would have survived the coming revelations. In any case, when the revelations of the Black Sox came to light in September, Baseball's owners had a bigger problem than their internal squabbles. The public could no longer trust their product. They now turned to a new plan, first advocated by a name, man named Albert Lasker, as you had asked about in 1919. Lasker was an advertising executive in Chicago, well-connected within business circles. He had originally introduced William Wrigley to the Cubs' ownership and owned a piece himself. After watching the National Commission in action for a couple of years, Lasker believed baseball needed a new governance structure. In 1919, he proposed a triumvirate of prominent citizens, none with a financial interest in the sport, that that group be granted absolute powers. This was dubbed the Lasker Plan. At the time, most owners had little interest in assigning this type of authority and control to outsiders. Now, many owners reconsidered this more radical restructuring. The NL plus the Insurrectos became adherents to the plan. The Loyal Five stood firm with Johnson who was clearly gonna lose power in the new structure, but also because there was always risk in turning one's affairs over to someone without skin in the game. With the Loyal Five remaining recalcitrant, the 11 formally voted to create a new league, scrap the national agreement, adopt the Lasker plan, and offer the chairmanship of the triumvirate to Judge Landis at a salary of $50,000. The Loyal Five declared that if the Insurrectos bolted, they would install new franchises in New York, Boston, and Chicago, an incredibly costly endeavor, but they soon gave in. Once in agreement, the owners scrapped the three-person concept as too costly. Later that day, the owners went to Landis's courtroom to formally make the offer. Landis was given the final verdict on all disputes and he could not be challenged either publicly or in court. The owners retained jurisdiction over making rules and regulation. Baseball had finally put in place a structure that would last over seven decades. Not until 1992, when Milwaukee Brewers owner Bud Selig was made acting commissioner, did the owners remove outsider ownership and put one of their own back in charge. Great, thank you very much for that, Dan. And I, I'd ask that specific question about Lasker because in his own domain, he was an amazing advertising man and he was considered a, a huge innovator of his time. He's sort of the, the Dan Draper of Chicago advertising in the 1920s. And a lot of the brands that he rebranded 
are actually still thriving brands now. I know that um, Palm Olive Dish Soap was one of them, and, and mm -hmm. he was one of the early. So it fascinates me that he was involved in sort of rebranding baseball uh, in this way, you know, that if there was a commissioner of baseball, they could they could help sort of distance themselves from the, the scandal in the sport and the, the Black Sox scandal, of course, being the big one that was that it just happened. So thank you. That's a very complicated history that you tried to boil down into something short for us. Again, sort of like uh, I mentioned for Jacob, if you want to read more about how baseball ended up with a commissioner and, and an outsider in charge, uh, Dan's written a fantastic paper on Commissioner Landis, which again is part of the Sabre Century project. And I see that Jacob posted the link to that in the chat. So thank you for that answer, Dan. So Bill is our third speaker today. And I'm read again, I'll read your bio note, Bill, and then I'll ask you my question. So Bill Lamb is the editor of the Inside Game, the quarterly newsletter of Sabre's Dead Ball Era Committee, the author of Black Sox in the Courtroom, the Grand Jury, Criminal Trial and Civil Proceedings, and a regular contributor to the Black Sox Scandal Research Committee newsletter. Prior to his retirement, he spent more than 30 years as a state prosecutor and a county prosecutor in New Jersey. So here's my question for Bill. Shortly after the Black Sox players were acquitted in the criminal trial, Commissioner Landis banned them from the game for life. Was there any precedent for this kind of action? And why do you think Landis felt he had to take this kind of action? I don't know if, oh, there we go. Karen, can you still hear me? We can, loud and clear. Okay, uh, then I can let my wife go. <laughs> you <laughs> to, can. To answer your question, to answer your question, there was general precedent uh, for the expulsion of players that uh, dates back to the 1860s. Uh, and uh, sporadically on a case-by-case -case basis, players were expelled uh, uh, throughout the next uh, several decades, uh, the 1877 uh, Louis, uh, Louisville team uh, uh, was involved in some game fixing uh, that led to the expulsion of four players. Um, Jack O'Connor and uh, Harry Howell were, were expelled for some shenanigans in the uh, Ty Cobb, uh, Nap uh, Lajoie uh, batting race of 1910. Horace uh, Fogel was expelled uh, in 1912. He was the uh, Phillies uh, owner. But generally speaking, uh, it was very sporadic on a case by case basis. The instructor precedent comes from the minor leagues, and it's a scandal in 1919 that involves the Pacific Coast League. And uh, uh, for me to, to explain that, uh, I, I can do the Cliff Notes version. For those who are really interested in the comprehensive treatment, uh, I'm going to push put this in front of the screen. There's a, there's a, a very excellent article by Larry Gerlach in the uh, 2012 version of Baseball Journal of the Early Game, and that sets forth all the detail that anybody uh, would want to know. Uh, I'll give you the uh, uh, the truncated version. And basically in 1919, you have a very tight pennant race between the Vernon Tigers and the Los Angeles Angels uh, with the Salt Lake in third place. And there's a crucial extended home and home series between the two teams um, that's probably going to decide the race. And going into the series, uh, Salt Lake had had a lot of success against uh, Vernon, had beaten them eight of 12 games. But in this series, they lose nine of 11 including on the last five, and they play very poorly. And there are rumblings about this, because this makes the difference between Vernon winning the pennant and Los Angeles losing it. Uh, so after the season, uh, amidst this rumbling, uh, Pacific Coast leaders uh, appointed a new president, a businessman from Los Angeles named William McCarthy. And over the next months, he conducts an inquiry into uh, these allegations. And in August, 1920, even before the Black Sox scandal uh, explodes, uh, this all is uh, revealed to the public. And it is a, a sensation of an order of the Black Sox scandal on the West Coast, where the Pacific Coast League is deemed virtually a major league. Um, it's very complicated. There's a lot of moving parts. Uh, and uh, if I could boil it down to this, it comes down to that there's credible evidence discovered that uh, the Vernon team captain, the first baseman, Babe Borton, had bribed Salt Lake's two best players, Harl Maggard and Bill Rumbler, to lay down during the series. And he had done so at the behest of a notorious West Coast gambler named, named Nate Raymond, 
who allegedly won over $50,000 betting on both the games and the outcome of the pennant race. Now, what's important to understand is that there's going to be a grand jury inquiry, much like the one conducted in Chicago about the, about the 1919 World Series. And it's going to be confronted by the same problem, which is this, that in 1919, there is no specific sports correct, uh, corruption statute. So fixing games per se is not illegal in the eyes of the criminal law. So in order to prosecute these kind of cases, you have to shoehorn the charges into some sort of a, a fraud charge, uh, uh, obtaining money by false pretenses or via a confidence game, something along that nature, which is what they do. And in December, the grand jury returns a multi-count indictment, which charges Borton, Maggart, Rumbler, Raymond, with various uh, fraud-related charges. The defense immediately files a motion to dismiss these charges, alleging that, you know, it's not a crime. And just before Christmas, actually the day before Christmas, a Los Angeles Superior Court judge named Frank Wiltz agrees with him. Uh, basically, he says the conduct led to the indictment, while it's certainly reprehensible, doesn't constitute a crime. The players are obligated to perform to their best pursuant to the terms of their contract. Game throwing violates that contractual duty. But that's a civil matter, not a criminal matter. The remedy is for the employer to sue these miscreants for breach of their contract. Charge dismissed. The outrage in the Pacific Coast League is the, the reaction, rather, they're outraged. And McCarthy declares, and I'm going to quote him, players indicted and convicted, in the, these players have been convicted and indicted in the eyes of the Pacific Coast League baseball public. If the law can't punish them, it remains for baseball to do something and to keep these corrupt players from participating in the professional ranks. And they do. In January 1921, Borton, Maggart, and Rumbler and an unindicted pitcher named Gene uh, Dale are expelled from the Pacific Coast League, and then they're expelled from organized baseball in its entirety by the... Uh, National Association of Minor Leagues. These expulsions coincide with uh, what's going on in the, in the Black Sox case on the legal front. Um, it's my opinion that uh, given the autocratic nature of Judge Landis and the plenary power that's been given to him over ball players, that he doesn't need any instruction, but he's gonna take it anyway. Uh, one thing you have to remember is that uh, even before the Black Sox, Newly installed Commissioner uh, Landis had already expelled uh, Gene Paulette for consorting with gamblers and engaged in suspected game fixing. So he had set his own precedent. But the Pacific Coast League case fits very nicely. And uh, when the Black Sox case gets stalled in court, uh, Landis tips his hand. He lets, he lets everybody know where he's going. He says, here's another quote, baseball is not powerless to protect itself. All of these players must vindicate themselves to be remitted to baseball. So basically, he's putting the burden of proof on them. Don't tell me you're not guil guilty. Prove to me that you're innocent. And of course, uh, when they don't testify at trial, that seals the deal for uh, for Landis or constitutional rights or not. Uh, the next day, as we all know, uh, he throws them out. Now, why did Landis do it? Well, this is a matter of Lamb's opinion, uh, but. Uh, my attitude is that uh, he's hired, his hiring is driven by the, the injury done to Major League Baseball's image by the Black Sox scandal. First and foremost, his responsibility is to take steps designed to ensure or to restore public confidence in the integrity of the game. Uh, look, gambling on baseball dates back to the 1860s, and he has nothing in his power that's going to eradicate that. He has no authority or professional gamblers or bookmakers, or baseball uh, betting pool operators, and over fans who want to bet on baseball. They don't take orders from Landis, but ball players do. And so what he's going to do is he is going to set a policy by way of this edict that, that comes down the day after the verdict that will instill the fear of God into ball players who are thinking about um, conspiring with, with gamblers to throw games. Um, and basically, they're now on notice that anything involving game fixing is going to grant you automatic and permanent expulsion from baseball. And what's important here is the Buck Weaver aspect of it. Now, whether or not Weaver was an active participant in the fix, and I'm smiling at Jacob when I'm saying this, uh, is that opinions are different. Uh, I, unlike Jacob, happen to think he was actively involved in the fix, and he got what was coming to him. And I won't go on and mention his, uh, his involvement in game fixing in 1920. But even if you sympathize with Weaver, and think that all he did was attend meetings. 
the Landis Edict specifically condemns that kind of conduct. And so even if you entertain but do not participate in game fixing, you're going to be expelled just as quickly as the game fixers. And this has a remarkably effective deterrent uh, effect. Um, game fixing virtually disappears. And players who are approached with game fixing propositions in the next couple of years, like Les Mann, who's contacted by a drunken Phil Dukes about throwing games, or Heine Sand, who's approached by Jimmy O'Connell uh, about fixing a game for the Giants, immediately report it. And these guys were expelled. And so whether or not you approve of Commissioner Landis, uh, the fact of the matter is, in 1921, he set a remarkably important precedent that did an enormous amount of good for baseball in restoring public confidence in the integrity of the game and virtually suppressing uh, game fixing for the next, I don't know, maybe 100 years. So that's what I think. Fantastic answer. We we'll always love the lab theories. You could always hear those with us. <laughs> They're always very well informed theories. And I love the quote you read to us about baseball um, taking care of itself, because that does echo in, in the statement made by Landis when he was banning the, the players as well. Uh, it's even sort of similar language that he that he used. So I have a second question for Bill now. For Bill, for several of the Black Sox players, the criminal trial did not mark the end of their time in court. Could you tell us something about the civil trials that followed? What factors led to those trials happening and what results did they have for the players? Well, after the uh, White Sox, the Black Sox were acquitted, four of the players uh, instituted civil litigation against the White Sox on various uh, theories of, uh, uh, of injury. Uh, the first one was filed by Buck Weaver. It was a uh, Weaver had been suspended in late September 1920, and he was not allowed to play at all in 1921, which would have been the third year of a three-year contract he signed in 1919. So he sues in Chicago Municipal Court uh, for $20,000, his salary plus damages to his reputation, etc. cetera. Um, that case really doesn't go anywhere. Um, and uh, it, it sort of just churns uh, away in pretrial proceedings. And finally, it's dismissed in uh, December 1925 for lack of prosecution by the plaintiff. That's probably because there's a settlement in the works. And according to Gene Carney, uh, uh, they settled for, at a court for about $3,500, uh, which, which is about one half of the withheld salary that Weaver would have gotten had he been paid for 1921. But that case isn't of great interest. What's significant to a Black Sox scholars and people whose heads come to a point uh, are the ensuing suit, suits uh, filed by Happy, well, Happy Felsch, uh, Joe Jackson, and uh, Swede Riesberg. These were filed in April 19, uh, 1922 in Milwaukee. Uh, one, because Chicago White Sox were uh, a Wisconsin corporation. But more importantly, the driver of this lawsuit is a very ambitious young uh, attorney uh, from uh, Milwaukee named Ray Cannon who had been a, a pretty good semi-pro ball player and actually a uh, teammate uh, of Happy Felsch. Cannon was also involved in trying to revitalize the players union, uh, which had been, which had fallen uh, into disrepute after the federal league and things like that. Um, I happen to think that the motivator of this suit is the lawyer. And I'm not an admirer of Ray, of Ray uh, Cannon. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, he's a glorified ambulance chaser. Uh, but uh, uh, he certainly uh, had a reputation for uh, uh, winning his cases. And he persuaded, I think, uh, these three players uh, to institute litigation. And basically, they're suing not only for a breach of their, their contracts, but also for uh, uh, interference with their ability to make a livelihood, uh, defamation character, and the like. Um, over time, these suits get pared down, as they always do in pretrial litigation. Only one of them goes to trial, and that is the Jackson uh, breach of contract suit. And uh, what's remarkable about that is not so much the specifics of it. One is that the White Sox turned down an offer from Ray Cannon to settle everything, everything out of court for 8,000. They were out of their mind not to accept that, to run the risk of a, of a jury verdict. If they hadn't learned anything from the Black Sox case, you would think by now they'd know, don't trust lay people to, to favor us. And of course, the, the things that might come out that you'd just assume not during the course of either discovery or the trial. But in any event, they, they, they bring the case to trial. And what's remarkable about it is the cross-examination of Joe Jackson uh, by the uh, 
Sox lead uh, defense lawyer, uh, a guy named George Hudnall, who is very tough minded. And uh, for me, the thing is striking is that Jackson um, is confronted with his grand jury testimony in which he admitted he'd uh, agreed to participate in the fix and he'd actually accepted $5,000 uh, from that. So Hudnall confronts him with the transcript of this. And ordinarily when witnesses, can, it's my experience, when witnesses confronted with a prior inconsistent statement, they try and rationalize it. They explain it away or they try and harmonize it or they dance around and try and get around it. Not Joe Jackson. He was handed a transcript and said, I never said this. I didn't say that. I didn't say this either. That's wrong too. I mean, everybody's looking at him like he's got three heads and the judge is sitting there fuming. His lawyer's got his head down and this goes on for about 120 times. When he is finished, the judge excuses the jury for the day and finds Jackson in contempt of court and has him locked up for basically for, for, for perjury. Let's him out the next day. The lawyers take the case to the jury and the jury, lo and behold, finds in favor of plaintiff Jackson to the tune of $16,711.84, something like that. Judge, the judge, a very experienced and basically liberal judge named John J. Gregory, he has a fit. He reads them the riot act, vacates the verdict and dismisses the case with prejudice. But actually when the verdict was explained by the jury foreman, it made perfect sense. The jury said, listen, the Jackson testimony, we didn't pay any attention to that. We didn't exonerate him. Rather, we found that based upon the investigation after the series that Comiskey had conducted for his own sake, he knew that Jackson and Reesberg and Felsch and the others had fixed the World Series. But even knowing that, he decided to sign them to multi-year contracts anyway. He had, in fact, condoned, it's called condemnation of the law, or forgiven their transgressions. He still wanted them on the team. Now, of course, the public knows what Kaminsky knew all along. He doesn't get to vacate the contract that he entered into freely now that it, he's embarrassed by it. So you're out of luck, Charlie. You signed these guys, now you got to pay them. Um, that was the theory of the, of the, of the jury. And it, it does make a, a good deal of sense. But uh, Judge Gregory didn't care. Uh, he said, this case is done. He refused to hear anything from uh, Felsch and Risberg. And like Weaver, they eventually settled out of court for basically nuisance sums. So this is a very interesting interlude and sheds a lot of light on, the, on some of the actors in the Black Sox scandal. But unless you're a Black Sox aficionado, I don't know how much appeal it has uh, beyond that. I don't know. I, you, I thought that was fascinating. You certainly made it sound fascinating. You even had a bit of the Hollywood ending with the, the, the surprising ver jury verdict. It's just not what you see coming after the man's been locked up for perjuring himself. You know, it's not really what you think will be the next step. What I should have mentioned is that Happy Felsch was also locked up. He got on the witness stand as a witness for Jackson and uh, he got all balled up and the judge locked him up as well. He eventually pled guilty. Uh, to a charge of false swearing and was sentenced to probation. Jackson was actually charged by the Milwaukee County uh, District Attorney, uh, but he avoided uh, process by staying out of Wisconsin for decades and the charge was eventually dismissed. So uh, uh, this is all very interesting, uh, you know, for, for guys like me, but, uh, you know, and Jacob and, uh, and Dan and a few others, but uh, I don't know how much your audience cares. Well, I thought that was cool. And thank you for telling us that. I thought that sounded very dramatic. Definitely could be a made for television feature. <laughs> I think yeah. that would work. As long as it's not made by John Sales. <laughs> no. We know your feelings about Eight Man Out. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> thank you, Bill. Those were great answers. Yeah. So my next question is for Jacob again. Jacob, Commissioner Landis banned the eight Black Sox players from the game of baseball for life. But did they really stop playing baseball? Could you tell us something about the players after careers in the game? Sure. You know, this was, uh, again, part of a very dramatic uh, aftermath um, with what happened. You know, they were free men for less than 24 hours after the trial verdict uh, in August of 1921. And then the very next day, Judge Landis issues this proclamation that they can no longer make a living playing professional baseball. They are out. Um, fortunately for the Black Sox in the 1920s, they were entering this period where there was independent baseball 
everywhere in the country, um, including in Canada and Mexico as well. Um, and so there were teams available uh, for them to play baseball and actually make a living this way. Because what would happen is you'd have a, a, a team uh, it, representing, you know, a city uh, in Western Illinois or Iowa or Montana or you name it. Uh, every town in the country had a team. Uh, the scene in Field of Dreams where Moonlight Graham is hitchhiking and uh, talking about, you know, being able to get a job during the day to play ball at nights and weekends. Um, this was what life was like in the 1920s. And so if you had talent um, for any reason and you weren't playing organized professional baseball, you could still find a way to play ball. You would get a job with a company and play on the company team. Um, or you would play on the town team and it would be sponsored by businessmen uh, in the city. And so that's what the Black Sox did throughout the 1920s and all the way into the late 1930s. Uh, Shoeless Joe really was, you know, 50 years old, put on 50 pounds and, you know, lost a step, but he could still hit and he was still able to play baseball. And so that's what the Black Sox did throughout the rest of the decade. And then into the 1930s, they ended up playing ball everywhere. Um, we've got uh, more than a thousand baseball games uh, in this, you know, independent semi-pro um, outlaw leagues uh, all across the country. We've got more than a thousand games documented now uh, where one or more of the Black Sox played. Uh, there's a, the final scene of the eight men out movie. Um, is fiction, just like the rest of it, but the, it's this amazing scene of Shoeless Joe Jackson in New Jersey playing ball in the 1920s, and supposedly Buck Weaver is in the stands watching him. Um, that part didn't happen, but Shoeless Joe really did play in New Jersey, in New York and Pennsylvania uh, in the mid-1920s, um, and you know, Buck Weaver also played ball. Um, this was something that they, you know, this is how they made their livings. Uh, Swede Risberg ended up playing until, I think, 1935, 1936, um, Shoeless Joe kind of off and on into the mid-1930s. Buck Weaver um, famously came back to Chicago uh, in 1927 after playing around the country. And uh, he ended up playing in Chicago in the, in the semi-pro leagues with a whole bunch of other uh, former major leaguers, including some of his old White Sox teammates like uh, Lefty Sullivan and uh, Hippo Vaughn, the former Cubs pitcher, uh, was, was a uh, famous pitcher in these leagues. And this is what they did. This is how they made a living. They would get paid either by the game. They would get paid, you know, for the entire season. Sometimes they would get a house out of it uh, or a job uh, where they could work in the off season. So yeah, this is, uh, you know, pretty much uh, how they ended up making their living. They really didn't have any other skills, any other marketable skills uh, in the labor market. So, you know, this is what they did. They ended up playing ball. And did they end up, um, speaking of Field of Dreams, and, and we're going to, our fourth um, panelist today is going to talk about Shoeless Joe, the, the novel that inspired the film, but did they use this, assumed names? That's one of the things that comes up in the novel and the film, you know, that Shoeless, that there's that great quote about, I saw, I, my father said he saw him once, but under an under, under assumed play, name and, and with wearing his shoes, wearing shoes. Um, is that something that they did? There are a couple instances where we have found that the Black Sox did use assumed names and Shoeless Joe did uh, very briefly. And this was kind of during this time, uh, like Bill was talking about, where they were uh, filing their lawsuits against Charles Comiskey and the White Sox. They, you know, still held out hope that they were going to get back into the major leagues at some point in the early 1920s. Um, and so at this time, they did use assumed names occasionally. But what they found is that by using their own names, um, you know, the, the American public uh, loves kind of this redemption story. And, you know, they had a lot more fans. They, they were able to draw larger crowds by using their real names. Um, because, you know, one thing to remember about this time in the 1920s is that Major League Baseball was a very small, self-contained entity, uh, mostly in the Northeast and in the Rust Belt uh, what is now the Rust Belt, in, you know, Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, those cities. So if you lived anywhere else in the country, if you lived west of St. Louis, if you lived south of Washington, D.C., you had no opportunity to watch major league, you know, talented major league caliber players um, play baseball. And so if Buck Weaver shows up in your town, if Shoeless Joe shows up and wants to play a game, um, that's going to draw a much, much larger crowd. And consequently, they were able to make a lot more money uh, that way by using their real names and by advertising, promoting uh, their, you know, infamous reputations. Um, and, you know, they could take the booze, they could take the jeering from fans. And that was something that happened all across the country. Um, but yeah, they were able to make a better living by saying, hey, Shoeless Joe Jackson's coming to town, come watch him. 
Um, you know, and if you're living in New Mexico, uh, Southern Arizona, you know, California, somewhere, um, you're not going to have a chance to watch these guys play in the major leagues because the major leagues is, you know, off, you know, in New York and Chicago and places that you've never been and never even dreamed of going. Um, and then all of a sudden these guys show up in your town and you get to watch them play. So this was something that was very lucrative for them, uh, at least, you know, until the great depression hit. Um, but in the 1920s, you know, they were able to make a pretty good living that way, uh, using their real names. Fascinating answer. Thank you for adding that. All right, we're going to switch back to Dan now. And Dan, I have another question for you about Commissioner Landis. So Commissioner Landis made more than one firm decision about play during his first season acting as commissioner in 1921. Not long after he banned the eight Black Sox players from the game for life, he also made a firm decision involving Babe Ruth. Could you tell us something about the 1921 Landis Babe Ruth showdown and how things played out? Sure. You know, we need to start uh, with a little background. After the 1910 season, baseball prohibited the World Series winner from barnstorming. Uh, that season's champion Philadelphia A's had toured Cuba after the series. They were missing a couple of their top players on the tour, but they still had a solid squad. Uh, in Cuba, they ended up losing six to 10 games. The National Commission, uh, sparked by AL President uh, Ben Johnson, felt these games hurt the prestige of the World Series. And the A's were making plans to tour Japan after the 1911 season, uh, which would fur add further embarrassment, they felt, if the A's won the series again and struggled in Japan. So the commission passed a rule prohibiting the World Series champion from barnstorming after the season. Uh, later, the other pennant winner and the players as individuals were added to this prohibition as well. In fact, it was actually a well-reported incident prior to the Landis Ruth showdown that included the Babe. Uh, many of the 1916 Red Sox, including Ruth, were fined and denied their World Series emblems, uh, which were the equivalent to essentially of today's World Series ring for playing an exhibition game in New Haven, Connecticut. Well, in January 1921, brand new Commissioner Landis reiterated his intention to enforce this rule. Ruth, uh, who earned a lot of money from this barnstorming, had no intention of adhering to this edict. He had apparently worked out a lucrative barnstorming deal. So Ruth approached Yankees GM Ed Barrow to ask for a special dispensation. Uh, Barrow told him that he had no objections to Ruth's winter tour, uh, but he also told him that he needed Judge Landis's consent. Landis, as we know, liked the limelight, so he invited Ruth to come to see him. Ruth declined because of a party he wanted to attend instead. Uh, this, of course, offended the commissioner. Ruth merely called Landis a short time later to just to tell him he was going. Landis emphatically told him he did not have permission. Uh, after the call, Landis supposedly slammed down the phone and he reportedly yelled, who the hell does that big ape think he is? Well, anyway, Ruth ignored Landis and along with Bob Musil, he embarked on the barnstorming exhibition. As the tour dragged on, uh, the Yankees management recognized that their star was in trouble for his 1922 eligibility. They began lobbying Landis to keep any punishment as light as possible. Barrow even traveled to Chicago to try and soften Landis, with whom he had become friendly. After talking to Landis, Barrow realized he could do little but hope for leniency when Landis eventually ruled on the punishment. Several weeks later, Landis ruled that Ruth and Musil would be suspended until May 20th, well into the 1922 season. Uh, after this ordeal, you know, even the owners recognized that not letting the champion players barnstorm was a little bit onerous. So they actually revised the rule during that 1922 season. Players on the pennant winners could now petition Landis for the right to limited barnstorming. You know, I just, as one final interesting aside, uh, I just want to re remember that Ruth also lost out on his best chance to manage in the majors when he similarly ignored a summons. Uh, after the 1933 season, Barrow and Tigers owner Frank Navin agreed that the Yanks would consider trading uh, Ruth to the Tigers uh, as a player manager. Navin hoped Ruth could generate attendance and excitement in Detroit in the middle of the Depression. Prior to making the trade, the Tigers owner su summoned Ruth to Detroit to sound him out on the idea. Uh, Ruth, however, was about to depart for Hawaii for a series of exhibition games. 
Uh, he chose not to delay that and told Navin he'd see him when he got back. Uh, Barrow rightly feared Navin would not wait around for the manager and told Ruth he should see Navin. But be, Ruth being Ruth, he ignored Barrow's advice. And unfortunately, Barrow was right. Navin had no intention of waiting around for Ruth to return. Uh, instead, he bought catcher Mickey Cochran from the A's for $100,000 to be his player manager. And, and as we know, Ruth never got another chance to manage. So I, I would just uh, conclude here, you know, so Ruth, Ruth, Ruth had a surprisingly sophisticated understanding of who he was and his importance in baseball, given sort of the childlike um, impression that people have sometimes given about Ruth. But uh, it, it, sometimes he just didn't quite know when to uh, when, when to uh, sort of go talk to the powers that be. There you go. The, the moral of the story is obey the summons when it comes. <laughs> <laughs> At least when the people have that kind of control. <laughs> like, so they have that kind of control over your career. Anyway, uh, I just thought since we were talking about 1921, it would be good to have you. Since I know our main subject is the Black Sox trial, but I thought it would be neat for people to know about the showdown, the, the Ruth Landis showdown that happened at the very end of the season. And my understanding is Landis's office was actually in Chicago. So that's still a Chicago story. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. So now we have our last speaker and our last two questions of this panel this afternoon. So our fourth and final speaker is Willie Steele. Willie Steele is a professor of English at Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee. He is the author of A Member of the Local Nine, Baseball and Identity in the Fiction of W.P. Kinsella, and Going the Distance, The Life and Works of W.P. Kinsella. He is also the editor of Nine, a journal of baseball history and culture, published by the University of Nebraska Press and co-directs the annual Nine Spring Training Conference in Arizona. He is currently working on developing his knuckleball in case the teaching career doesn't work out. We're very glad to have you here with us today, Willie. And we're going to move a bit into uh, closer to the, the present now with our questions for you. We were in the 1921 with Dan, Jacob, and Bill. But now we're, we're going to talk about what the surreal afterlife of the story of the banning of the eight men out. So my first question for you, Willie, you have written a biography about the author W.P. Kinsella, whose novel Shoeless Joe inspired the movie Field of Dreams, in which the eight Black Sox players banned for life from baseball in 1921 are able to magically emerge from an Iowa cornfield to once again play the game they love. Based on your research and your discussions with Kinsella himself, could you tell us about some of the things in Kinsella's real life that inspired events and characters in Shoeless Joe. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Sharon, for putting this together and inviting me. I, I feel like the one kid that doesn't belong at the cool kids table because everybody else is kind of talking about, you know, 1921 in that era. And I've kind of been jotting down a lot of the stuff I didn't know before. So thanks for allowing me to, uh, to be a part. Um, I'm, going, I'm going to assume that most of us have either read Shoeless Joe and or seen Field of Dreams. So I'm not going to, to bore you with the background there. But um, a lot of what's in Shoeless Joe, even though he claimed to not write autobiography, um, a lot of what Kinsella writes is autobiographical. His father, uh, uh, John, was a semi-pro ball player, like as mentioned at the beginning of the, the novel and the opening lines uh, with Costner doing the voiceover in the film. And uh, he did tell his son, he did tell Bill Kinsella as a young kid, um, uh, Kinsella was for the first 10 years of his life, lived by him uh, as, as an only child about um, uh, 60 miles north of Edmonton. And uh, he was the only kid for several miles around. And so um, his dad would you know, tell him stories and a lot of those stories included ball players that he had seen. And he had watched, um, if you believe his father, he had watched um, the 1919 Chicago White Sox. And so, um, you know, Kinsella would have heard those stories about she was Joe Jackson, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that part's true. Um, Kinsella was, his father was an American, his mother was Canadian, uh, but really his first time for any extended period of time in the U.S. was when in the middle of the 1970s, he went to the Iowa Writers Workshop, the University of Iowa uh, in Iowa City, and he fell in love with the, with the landscape, fell in love with the people. Um, he tried to uh, stay in the States and applied for teaching jobs all over, but um, the teaching job he ultimately was offered and took 
was at the uh, University of Calgary, which he so not so affectionately called desolate U. Um, and he said that five years was the longest decade he ever um, uh, had. And um, as he's getting ready to leave to go back to uh, Calgary uh, to teach, this was 1978, he wrote a, a story called Shoeless Joe Jackson Comes to Iowa. And um, what he did for Kinsella, the question for any good fiction writer is to ask, what if? All right, so he started thinking about these stories that his father told him. He said, well, what if a, a farmer in Iowa hears a voice? What if that voice says, if you build it, he will come? And what if that he refers to Shoeless Joe? And then it's this what if, what if, what if? And then he starts, you know, okay, kind of telling that story. Well, he expects it to be a one-off kind of a fun story that's part of a, a larger collection. And then it's uh, turned into uh, when, a, when an assistant to an editor in Boston, Larry Kessenick, um, reads a two-sentence description of the story. This is great. He didn't even read the story yet. He read a two-sentence blurb. He writes a letter to Kinsella and says, I think you should turn this into a novel. Um, and it turns into Field of Dreams. And that's when Kinsella goes and researches J.D. Salinger, you know, not the Terrence Mann character, but he goes and kidnaps Salinger. He incorporates the Moonlight Graham character to whom uh, Jacob had referred a moment ago. Um, you know, he incorporates a lot of the, the players' names uh, from the time period. And so um, it's that mix of, you know, fact and fantasy that creates magical realism for which Kinsella is known. And so um, there's a healthy dose of both. The, the, the fact with the 1919 White Sox, Shoeless Joe, then Moonlight Graham, um, and he kind of mixes that in with enough of uh, fantasy where it all kind of blends together and makes what I think is a pretty darn good story. So. I think a lot of people around the world would agree with you, both the book and the and the um, movie. And that's surprising because very often you would know as someone who teaches English, usually it's just excruciatingly painful to watch the movie made about a great book that you love. Yeah. Um, but in this case, actually, the translation um, was it, it's very beautifully done. And maybe actually because the book and the movie there are some pretty big differences how before I ask my what was supposed to be my final question maybe I could just say what did Kinsella think was he happy with the with the transition from his book to the movie I mean they dropped some of his characters and things and there's some pretty substantial things that are changed was he okay with that yeah he was when Phil Robinson uh, Kinsella always said that his books were like bread he said, you sell the bread, and if somebody cuts them up and makes nice sandwiches, that's good. If somebody tears up the bread and feeds it to the ducks, that's also good, but pay me for my bread. And so um, he was a very pragmatic, you know, I mean, he, you know, it's making a dollar. In fact, the summer before he died, um, when the Cubs, this was in 2016, when the Cubs were playing really well, um, I told him, I said, your short story, The Last Pennant Before Armageddon, is about the Cubs winning the last pennant before the end of the world you might turn out to be a prophet. And Kinsella, this is maybe, I don't know, six or eight weeks before he passed away, Kinsella said, we need to reach out to the publisher and have them reissue that. I could make a lot of money off of it. Um, and then to me, the weirdest part of that story is the night that he died is the day that is, is the evening that uh, uh, Chicago clinched a spot in the playoffs, which was really weird. Um, you know, so there's, there's that part. But yeah, Kinsella, he loved the screenplay. Um, he didn't want to be a part of the screenwriting process. He said, I don't work well with others. And uh, Phil Robinson had sent him a note and said, um, you know, I, I can't keep everything in the novel because time won't allow it. Kinsella wrote him a note back and said uh, something along the lines of, Phil, uh, the script is yours. Do what you have to. Love, Bill. And then when Phil Robinson sent Kinsella the script, he read it and actually cried when he read it. Um, and he cried again in the movie theater in Canada when he was watching the premiere. And so he he's often uh, gone on record saying um, that he could not have done a better job himself writing the screenplay, which coming from somebody like Kinsella is about the highest praise you can get. Absolutely, especially since I, I love your wonderful biography of Kinsella, but what comes through Thank very you. clearly is that he was a, a, a somewhat difficult man, and you must be actually a fairly patient biographer because uh, he he was he was a little bit curt and arguably abusive with a lot of people in his life. So yeah, when, when his agent his his literary we shared the both his, his both shared the same literary agent, and when Bill died. Um, she was interviewed and she called him, and this is one of his closest friends for 30 years. Uh, she called him irascible. She called him a curmudgeon. 
And I'm thinking, if this is your close friend, what in the world are your enemies going to say about you? Um, and they said a lot, as you might expect. So, <laughs> well, you know what? He great. He made great art. So that's there you that, go. It is what it is, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. So my final question for you is about the real, real life, and and actually just this month, which is uh, crazy. Uh, you were one of the fortunate people who was able to attend Major League Baseball's. Field of Dreams game, first ever MLB game in Iowa, and uh, you actually were able to attend with one of Kinsella's daughters. So could you just tell us something about that experience? Yeah, I had every expectation that Major League Baseball was going to find a way to screw this up. Um, they, they could mess up a one car parade. And so I thought that this was going to be what happened. Um, it, it was, it, to my great surprise, a fantastic event. I mean, the, the whole thing was just amazing. Um, I, I took my 13 year old daughter. Um, we found out we were getting tickets a little more than a week out. And so we, we scrambled around, um, to get flights up there. And, and then we had to drive four hours West to Dyersville. And no matter what the film makes it look like when the camera pans out at the end of the movie, and there's that long line of 1500 cars. And you look at that and you think, Oh, that's so romantic. It's not. Um, it is horrible being stuck on, on any of those roads in Dyersville. Um, it was horrible. Um, but once you got parked, it, it was, it was wonderful. We went in there, my daughter and I, um, uh, went and threw the ball on the field and, and, you know, we got to, she got to see Costner and thought that was great. And, you know, and so we went through the corn maze and, uh, and then we go in and sit down with Shannon Kinsella, uh, Bill Kinsella's oldest daughter. And that was the first time she had been back to Dyersville since, uh, she had been on the movie set for 10 days with her dad, um, and, and night in the summer of 1988. And so, um, it was it was really something else. And I think there were a couple of parts that were really just a, a fantastic um, experience. And it was at the beginning of the game, the pregame, when Costner came out and was kind of wandering around there really strangely, you know, sort of like he was lost. And then he turns and then the 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 players come out of the corn and having grown up in corn country in Ohio, you knew that was coming because those corn rows were planted way too far apart. All right? No self-respecting farmer would have allowed that much space. You could have double parked a bus between them, um, and which is about what you need for Aaron Judge to walk out, right? And so, uh, but when they came out, I looked over at Shannon and, and she's, she's got tears. I mean, she's just, you know, she's smiling, she's crying. And then I'm sitting there like, I don't want to cry in front of my kid. Um, and so, you know, we, we kind of settled in and we watched the game and, uh, my, my daughter had said, you know, daddy, I can't cheer for the Yankees. And I said, oh, honey, nobody expects you to, I mean, you know, most of all me and Shannon heard that and said, you know, my dad hated the Yankees. And so we're all going to cheer for the white Sox. Said, okay. So then in the eighth inning, you know, we, we're going to win this thing. It's going to be great. And then the ninth inning happens and it's like, you have got to be kidding me. Um, and I know people say this and there's, so, but this is the honest to goodness thing. I turned to my daughter and I said, all we need is for one guy to get on base, somebody hit a home run and we're done. And of course I never thought it would actually happen. But then when it did, um, Shannon Kinsella wraps me in this tremendous bear hug. And again, is crying. And there were two or three people who came down and told her, said, your dad couldn't have written a better ending. And, and it really was, I mean, that was kind of the, the ending that we all wanted. I don't think anybody really expected, um, but it was fantastic. And, and it was great to share that with her because without her father, um, none of that happens, right? None, none of that happens. The movie doesn't get made. There's, there's no MLB game in Iowa. Um, and that tremendous ending is, is, is a non-event, right? So um, it was, it was something else. And I, I hope that if Major League Baseball continues this beyond next year, that it doesn't turn into a, you know, to a cartoon of itself like the All Star Game has become. So, thank you so much for that very moving answer. And um, I think even for those of us who were watching the televised version, I think we were all crying when the players were coming out of the court. That was just incredibly moving. And I was actually surprised at how moving that was, because even as you say, you know, it's staged and you know, they're going to do it. And even so, because the book and the movie are so magical, it is magic realism. 
you don't expect to see it coming to life. And I think for me, that was the thing is we don't see dreams coming true in our real lives. And it wasn't even a movie like this was taking place in real life yep. with real people who were about to play a real game. And to me, that was just I, I, I would be very surprised if there was a dry eye among the, the people watching anywhere, whether it was televised or live, because it just that really was magical. Yeah, there, there weren't a whole lot of dry eyes. And, and I'll tell you, it was, um, you know, it was one of those things that, yes, you knew it was coming. But the combination of the soundtrack that was playing, um, which I think James Horner's soundtrack is just fantastic. It's a character by itself in the movie. And then watching this stuff happen was just, uh, it, it was, it was something else and, and traffic was much better on the way out. So uh, <laughs> I felt, you know how when in, in 88, when Kurt Gibson hit the home run and as he's rounding first, you can see the taillights of a car. And I've often wondered what that person is thinking when they're hearing it on the radio, like, oh my goodness, Gibson just, you know, won the game. The people who left Field of Dreams to beat the traffic thinking, well, the White Sox are, you know, they're going to lose this. Yeah. Um, man, they missed out. <laughs> Stay to the bitter end. Well, there's exactly. always the lesson with it, with baseball. You do not know what yep. is going to happen. So, but as you said, it really, it couldn't have been a, a more magical event. And you know, what you said was very moving too about um, this couldn't have happened without Kinsella. It couldn't have happened without a writer who asked all those what if, what if, what if yeah. questions came up with an amazing answer. And one of the things I learned from reading your Kinsella biography that I had not known was that he became a, a writer uh, fairly late in life. And this is someone who, who had, I mean, he was a pizza restaurant owner and a taxi driver, and he had like a, a hard scrabble life, actually. And, and so to think how there's a lot of what if there as well. What if he had just kept driving a cab? Yeah. What if he had just running a, what ran his fairly successful pizza restaurant? You know, what if he had never decided to give creative writing a try? And that, again, when you think about all the stuff that came out of that one mind, uh, that's a frightening what if. Thank goodness yeah. he didn't go that way. Yeah, I don't know what I would have been writing about for the past 20 years. <laughs> it's a business. So it worked out well for both likely, of us. Likely not the guy in the pizza parlor. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I don't think my dissertation committee would have signed off on that. So no. <laughs> well, look, um, we have run out of time for the, the question and answer part of the panel, which has been fantastic. But we do have time because uh, this is a booked hour and a half so we have time now. If you have questions for the panelists, people were chatting in the chat, but they weren't real, uh, really questions. So if you want to just uh, put on your mic or if you want to, you don't mind being recorded, you can have your um, camera on as well. And uh, do feel free to ask the panelists questions. You might just want to indicate who your question is for. Well, I'll jump in right away with a, with a question. Um, it seems like the Chicago White Sox have always kind of kept their hands clean of dealing with or really embracing the 1919 team, the scandal and all of that. Um, even though they're really the franchise that somewhat innovated throwback games when, uh, when you go back to the final season of Old Comiskey Park and throwing on the 1917 uniforms. And uh, that's one that they tend to go to but they've always stayed away from 1919. But with the Field of Dreams game, they, they did. It's the first time that they've actually embraced it, said it's okay. I, I guess this is open really to anybody. Do you know if the team itself sort of uh, bristled a little bit of like, oh God, we're actually going to do this Field of Dreams game. And it, it's kind of teed up for us. So just a general question. Well, I I think I can answer this one because I've actually talked to some people in the White Sox front office about this very subject because when we were planning our, our Sabre uh, symposium in 2019 at the Chicago History Museum, um, you know, the White Sox uh, actually, uh, you know, did kind of give their blessing in a, in a quiet behind the scenes way, um, even though they didn't really have any official participation in it. Um, and one of the things they, they, they told me, uh, people in the front office, was that um, before 2005, when they won the World Series for the first time in 88 years, uh, the Black Sox scandal was a very sore subject uh, inside, you know, the team offices and then just among the fan base and everything else. Um, you know, it was just it was always something that everyone could hold against them was they had not won the World Series since this scandal. Um, but winning cures everything. And ever since 2005, they've 
just slowly become more and more open um, to the idea that this is just another part of their history. Um, and that, you know, just no different than 1959, no different than 1906, uh, you know, two other World Series years. This is just part of their history. Um, you know, everybody's dead uh, from the 1919 team. And so it's not something that is, you know, an open wound uh, for the team anymore, but it really took winning the World Series for that to happen. Um, and then of course, you know, now in the last few years since the Supreme Court decision on sports gambling, uh, baseball is opening its arms to all sorts of things that uh, they spent the last century uh, trying to avoid and disassociate themselves from. But that's a different panel. Yeah, if anybody has questions, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, chime in. While people are queuing up, I have a question related to that one, Bill, which is, um, how do you think they felt about the going back to the 1920s uniforms? Was that something, is there, was there, uh, is it again, uh, Jacob said sort of the same thing? Well, if you're number one team, you could, you could wear <laughs> a uniform from the 1920s that is associated with those famous pictures of the, of the eight men out. Do you think there was any issue with that? uh going back to, to doing that so going back to the original uniforms was there i guess it would be the same sort of thing that that, that you think sure. is probably okay because the the winning the winning erased the problem with going back in the past because that was a pretty direct yeah. going back in the past they looked like the white socks of the past yeah yeah well there's all merchandising too so that definitely uh is, is something that they can they can embrace right now there because i just on local radio after that all the people that were like, yeah, those caps were pretty sweet. I like that Sox logo. And you're going to start to see it everywhere, I think. So, yeah. yeah I think as long yeah, as Chris, Chris Sale is not on the roster, um, they don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like there's a question there. Yeah, I have, I have one comment. Bob Kamarowski in Minneapolis here. Um, I grew up on the south side of Chicago as a White Sox fan in the 50s and 60s, and uh, uh, the first time I heard about the Black Sox was um, through some um, relatives talking about it. Uh, when I was very, very young, this was probably, I would have to guess, maybe the late 50s when the White Sox were, you know, good and they won the tennis in 59. Now, I remember asking, um, I believe it was an uncle of mine, who were the Black Sox? Who were the Chicago Black Sox? I thought it was a team from Chicago at the time. I didn't know it was the White Sox. And I was told, you know, to, uh, you know, not talk about that, essentially. Uh, people were embarrassed about it, though. And this was, um, you know, this is like the late 1950s, though. So uh, you know, they didn't want it to, um, you know, they just wanted to enjoy the 1959 season and the end that was won and look forward to the World Series. So, yeah, what, what Jacob said is correct, though. You know, it was uh, the point of contention and people were embarrassed. Yeah, you know, and there's yeah, there's other writers. writers. Actually, Bob, if you can mute, it sounds like it's uh, echoing there. Um, there. You know, there's other writers from Chicago, um, you know, who talked about that, including, you know, Ernest Hemingway, uh, James T. Farrell, Nelson Algren, um, you know, who wrote about growing up in Chicago, you know, in 1919 or, or afterwards, um, you know, and they talked about this was something that, you know, White Sox fans, you know, heard about from other teams, especially Cubs fans um, throughout the city, you know, the, that they were around growing up with. And, and that's something that, you know, just kind of followed the franchise and followed the fan base uh, for years and years afterwards. And I think it took getting back to the World Series in 1959 for that to go away for that generation. And then, you know, for the rest of the, the fan base, it took winning the World Series in 2005, you know, for modern fans. Um, in order for the scandal to kind of recede into history. And, you know, this, again, this is just now part of our story, no different than, you know, the hitless wonders, no different than the go-go White Sox. It's just, it's part of the, the team's story these days um, and not, you know, this one black cloud hanging over everyone's heads. Well, Willie, you mentioned uh, having the Field of Dream game go on to be an annual event and they've David Ross sort of accidentally leaked that the Cubs are going to be a part of it next year and then they they officially announced that it would be Cubs and Reds does that work does it I 
I mean, I guess every fan has a connection to their own team. So you're going to be picturing your own players from the past coming out of the field. But I don't know if I want to see Kevin Costner walk out dazed again and, you know, see whoever the Cubs are next year. I'm not even sure you know, <laughs> what kind of makeup that would be. I don't know if it works. Uh, I kind of felt like it was a little bit of a one and done. Um, might last for a couple of years. I guess your thoughts on that. Yeah, I'm, I, we'll see is the short answer. I, I think um, I think this year's teams, to me, it would have made sense to have either White Sox Reds, like the 1919 series, or White Sox Cubs, um, because of Kinsella's second novel, The Iowa Baseball Confederacy, you know, which, I know, Jacob, you've been posting some stuff on Twitter, like, I want to see that. I want to see Drifting Away and the left-handed farm. I want to see every one of those guys on the field. Um, and if you've not read those novels, go read them. Um, but yeah, I think I'm afraid what's going to happen is that this will turn into a version of like the all-star game now or the old uh, NFL Pro Bowl, you know, where it it it's not a real game. It's more of the, you know, sales and and promotion and trying to capture this sense of nostalgia that it works once because we hadn't seen anything like that, but I'm afraid that next year it's kind of like, okay, well, we, we've already done this. And then the year after, if it continues, it's like, well, okay. I mean, show me something else. So um, we'll see. It, it's a, it's a beautiful field. I, I mean, I, I got, a, I took a picture as the sun was setting and it's this purplish pink sky and I posted it and there, you know, um, people kept comment, you know, like, what filter did you use? I'm like, I didn't, it's the filter is called Iowa. Um, and it's beautiful. Um, and so there's, there's that element, but it's a, it's a terrific, terrific field, but I just don't know if, if people are going to keep going back, you know, it's that, you know, yes, people came, but will they keep coming back? So we'll see. I don't know. We have a question in the chat now about the ban. Uh, so the, the comment was that the, that the uh, person writing this said that we heard that the lifetime ban ended with the player's death. What does the panel think of the chance that any of those players may get into the Hall of Fame? So maybe um, for those, you might, whoever answers might want to talk a little bit about that item. Is it true that the ban ended with their deaths? And um, and then if anyone wants to respond to the other part of the question. Um, so the, the stuff about the ban actually came out um, with the ESPN report last year. Um, and uh, Major League Baseball officials uh, went on record saying that they no longer consider the Black Sox as part of their ineligible list. Uh, permanently ineligible list and that any questions about their Hall of Fame eligibility um, really need to be directed to Cooperstown uh, and that the Hall of Fame uh, has its own jurisdiction to say, you know, these players are eligible and we will consider them in whatever form that may take. Uh, the Veterans Committee uh, seems to change every few years in how they elect players from 100 years ago. Um, but uh, Major League Baseball has essentially thrown up its hands and said, you know, we don't care <laughs> is, is basically uh, what they said. And so um, as far as, you know, whether the players will get into the hall of fame, I think Shula Joe Jackson is really the only player uh, from the Black Sox scandal that has a, a really strong case. I think you can make a case for Eddie Seacott as well, um, strictly for on field actions, but uh, Shula Joe is really the only one, um, you know, that anybody cares about uh, in that sense. And, Honestly, I don't see the Baseball Hall of Fame uh, changing its rules or its policies to allow, um, you know, that discussion to happen anytime soon. Uh, they, I think there's, you know, the, unfortunately, the, the Reds in the Field of Dreams game next season is going to uh, bring up um, the name of Pete Rose, uh, who I always strive not to mention in these, in these discussions, um, because Pete does a good enough job on his own of putting his own name out there uh, everywhere. But, uh, but, you know, Shula's show and Pete Rose's case are, are intertwined. And I think as long as Pete Rose is, is alive um, and fighting to get into the Hall of Fame and get back into baseball, um, I don't see Major League Baseball, I don't see the Baseball Hall of Fame doing anything to change that um, anytime soon. That's a really interesting answer, Jacob. Does anyone else want to add to that? 
I can't follow that up. I mean, that's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> Bill or Dan, did either of you want to comment? I agree with Jacob. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> it's interesting how you point out um, that history lives on in a way that it's the intertwined with the more recent situation where someone is still living to to fight their own case so that's a very interesting perspective on things that um history doesn't doesn't always slip away neatly even 100 years later depending on what happened subsequently <laughs> well and i've always wondered too if say they just decided let's have shoeless joe in in the hall of fame they have the ceremony what does that do to the overall story the mystery does it kind of wrap it all up and you sort of lose the marketing value around around the whole story I, that's what i've always kind of been concerned about i mean i work in marketing so i, I think about that kind of thing and it does it just does it kind of damage everything i guess no i'll, I'll let willie uh handle kind of the the legacy part of it and and you know the maybe the the mystical qualities of of you know why shoeless joe is still such a powerful uh, character and, and such a powerful figure. But uh, my friend, Mike Nola, who runs the Black Betsy website, uh, Sheila Sir Jackson historian for the last 30 years, um, you know, he has, he has said uh, for many years that Shoeless Joe is more famous outside the Hall of Fame than he ever would be if he was inducted. Um, and, you know, I think that's true. If you look at Shoeless Joe's contemporaries uh, who are in the Hall of Fame, players like Zach Wheat, uh, Harry Heilman, you know, other great outfielders from that era. Uh, nobody talks about them today, except, you know, maybe in a Sabre crowd. Um, but nobody, you know, the, they're not part of the zeitgeist. They're not part of the, the mainstream baseball conversation at all. Um, but Shoeless Joe is, and, and the Black Sox are. And, you know, part of that, I, I would like to take a little bit of credit with the work that, that Bill and, and all of our people in the Black Sox committee have done um, to keep the story alive and to discover uh, new aspects of the story in the last 10 or 20 years. Um, but, you know, this is a story that people find fascinating and, and you know, continues to live on and continues to have relevance uh, with all the sports gambling uh, issues that are popping up. I mean, you cannot watch a baseball game today without, you know, being bombarded by dozens of, of gambling ads. Um, you know, this is part of why the Black Sox scandal is still relevant. And so, you know, if Shoeless Joe gets in the Hall of Fame, um, there will still be bits and pieces of the story that are relevant, but I do think it would start to uh, diminish a little bit, uh, you know, the, the power of this story and the power of the possible redemption of someone like a Shoeless Joe, which is what, you know, Kinsella's book was really uh, all about, was just this idea that, you know, they would get one more chance to play, one more chance to, you know, have their names cleared. I think that's something that uh, lives on today. And if they were to, you know, be reinstated, if they were to be, you know, inducted into the Hall of Fame, I do think some of that power, you know, would start to fade. Yeah, I think, you know, historian Shelby Foote, a Southern writer and Civil War historian, once said that the two most famous names to come out of the Civil War were Scarlett O'Hara and Rhett Butler, right, fictional characters. And I think that even though Shoeless Joe is not fictional, the element of him that's been in fiction, uh, specifically with, with Shoeless Joe, is a compelling story, right? The Moonlight Graham, um, there's a short story that Kinsella wrote called Searching for January, where um, Roberto Clemente is on a life raft and comes uh, on this beach in, this, in 1987. And he thinks it's been five days since the plane crash, right? And so, and as a long time, long suffering Pirates fan, it would have been great in the 80s to have a healthy Roberto Clemente show up, right? We would have traded him, but it would have been nice. Um, but those parts of the story, right? I think, you know, like, like Jacob said, and, and even Kinsella said, um, it's not a baseball story. Right. It's a it's a love story about that has baseball in it or a story of redemption that has baseball in it. And so if you put Shoeless Joe into the Hall of Fame, I think the the reading of the novel would certainly change because that element is out. It's like, well, I mean, why is he coming back? He, he's in the Hall of Fame. People are going to remember, you know. And so it's that um, that aspect of having a second chance. You know, what happens if if Moonlight Graham decides, you know what, I'm going to go play a few more years, which he did, by the way. He, he played minor league ball for, you know, it's not like he walked away from baseball forever after that one at bat. Um, but that that's not what we want to know. We want to know this guy that went a different direction, right? And so those parts of the story 
um, where truth sometimes is stranger than fiction, um, it allows an opening for a story that applies to, you know, to the masses. So. Nicely said, for sure. There are universals in the story and the, and the sort of the having someone who is uh, suffering in that way and is seen as suffering. And I think I watched recently, thanks to your book, I learned about the, uh, what is it called? From page to screen, the documentary that, that they made about Field yeah. of Dreams in which Kinsella was interviewed. And I hadn't known about that. So thanks to you, I ran out and I bought the Blu-ray version of the movie so I could see the documentary. I had the old DVD, but I had, now I have the Blu-ray. And the documentary is great. And, and that is one of the things they talk about is the casting for the movie and why Ray Lolita was picked, even though he couldn't play baseball uh, and, and actually needed training in order to hit the ball, which is a fascinating sort of side note. They picked him because he had that look in his eyes of someone who had this sort of deep pain somewhere there. And I think absolutely true. He was the perfect actor to, to pick for that film because he does have that look. He doesn't have to even say anything. You just look at him and you think, oh my goodness, this man is suffering so much. He's been cut off from the love of his life, right? That's the whole, not only are they in need of redemption, but they, unlike Jacob telling us the truth that they kept playing baseball, <laughs> that idea that they've been cut off from, from the thing that they love most and that they cannot do it anymore is so big and so mythic and works so well in fiction and works so well in film and uh, as, as Kinsella obviously brilliantly figured out. Yeah, and thank you for continuing to plug the book. I feel like I owe you a <laughs> dinner or something. So put you well, on retainer one, for one the next book. <laughs> one, one day, hopefully I'll actually get to meet you and other Sabre members in person. I joined the, the organization during the pandemic. So I have, I have not met a single Sabre person in person and uh and i think uh bill keeps talking about these folks going to ball games together and i think this sounds lovely so hopefully that'll happen too one day i'll be able to see you in person one day I'll, I'll be able to watch a game but actually the plugging of your book is because it is fantastic i have to say i went in thinking i would just look for the things that i wanted for my own research and I was just going to read around the section about uh, Field of Dreams. And it was so compelling and so good that I went back to the beginning and I read the whole thing from beginning to end. And it's not every biography that makes you want to do that. You know, biographies um, don't all, they're not always page turners and yours absolutely is. It's a fascinating story and it's very well told. So Thank there you. you go. That's my honest opinion. And you didn't even offer me a drink before this panel. So. Thank you. I, I think people on Amazon need to hear that same thing. So thank you. <laughs> Well, I certainly encourage people who, who've tuned in for this to, to read your um, fantastic biography. And also, if they haven't read Shoeless Joe, to go back and read Shoeless Joe, because the, the book itself does stand up. Um, uh, and it really is a, a work of art that deserves, has lived and deserves to live. And as we've discussed, the, the movie has, has lived as well. Even Kevin Costner sounded a bit surprised when he talked about the fact that it was 30 years ago. And, um, and yet it has lived on and, and contributed to these great things. So we have only a few minutes left. I should hand things back, I suppose, to our actual chapter head and, and host of this session. So I will just conclude my part of it by saying thank you so much to the panelists who volunteered their time to be on this panel, to Willie, to Bill, to Dan, and to Jacob. Thank you so much. You are all a font of knowledge and always fun to talk to. So thanks for agreeing to be part of this. And back to you, Bill. Great. Well, thank you. It was a wonderful session. And uh, our, our uh... Our chapter chair, Rich Hansen, I, I do have to give him credit. He was the one who was really the brains behind having the session and, and uh, just with the dates and how everything had come together. So I know he wasn't on screen for very much of this, but uh, he was certainly the brains behind this one. So I want to make sure uh, he gets a, a shout out from us. So thank you again. Uh, again, this has been recorded. So I'll make sure I get that over to Jacob and we get that shared with uh, all of the other fantastic uh, Zoom and Facebook and all the other sessions we've been doing through the last year and a half. And um, yeah, so again, just on a, on a local note, again, September 11th is going to be our um, our chapter game, again, uh, teaming up with the uh, Wisconsin folks up in Beloit. So, uh, if, you know, if you're a member and you received our e-blast or our last newsletter, make sure you go back. Tim's information is in there and um, he's wrapping up a final headcount. So, again, 
Thank you, everybody. And Willie, what's the name of the book again? The biography is called Going the Distance, The Life and Works of W.P. Kinsella. And I always, anytime I do something with Sabre, I want to invite people, come out to Arizona in March for the Nine Conference. You get on nineconference.com and it has all the information. Uh, I know several of you, a couple of you have been out there before. I uh, would love to see you. We're going to be, fingers crossed, in person. Um, and we always plan in two days of field research. Um, so you can tell your dean, if you're a teacher, that you're doing field research. And we, it just so happens it's, it's at a baseball field. So... <laughs> Fantastic. So on that note, again, you know, thank you, Sharon, Jacob, Dan, Willie, and Bill. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you for taking your time out specifically for our chapter. We truly appreciate it. So excellent. Well, thanks, everybody. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Bye. Thanks, Bill.